Regret by K. Chopin. The story was first published in 1897 when it appeared in Chopin's short story collection A Night in Acadia. Marcel's story possesses good strong figure, ruddy cheeks, hair that was changing from brown to gray, and a determined eye. She wore a man's hat about the farm and an old blue army overcoat when it was cold and sometimes top boots. Mamsel Ari had never thought of marrying. She had never been in love. At the age of 20, she had received a proposal, but she had promptly declined. And at the age of 50, she had not yet lived to regret it. So she was quite alone in the world except for her dog Ponto and the uh, Negros who lived in her cabins and were her crops and the floors, a few cows and cover of mules, her gun with which she shot chicken, hawks and her religion. One morning, Mamsel's Ori stood upon her gallery contemplating with arms a gimbal, a small band of very small children who, to all intents and purposes, might have fallen from the clouds. So unexpected and bewildering was their coming, and so unwelcomed. They were the children of her nearest neighbor, Odile, who was not such a near neighbor after all. The young woman had appeared but five minutes before, accompanied by these four children. In her arms, she carried little Lodi. She dragged T. Nom by an unwilling hand, while McLean and McLeod followed with irresolute steps. Her face was red and disfigured from tears and excitement. She had been summoned to a neighboring parish by the dangerous illness of her mother. Her husband was away in Texas. It seemed to her a million miles away, and Wilson was waiting with the milk cart to drive her to the station. It's no question, Master Ori. You just go to keep those youngsters for me till I come back. Jill said, I wouldn't bother you with them. If it was any other way to do, make it my you. Ma'am said only, don't spam. Me there, I'm half crazy between the children. I'm not home. I may be not even to find poor mom and a life ankle. A harrowing possibility which drove all day to take a final hasty and convulsive leave of her disconsolate family. She left them crowded into the narrow strip of chairs on the porch of the long, low house. The white sunlight was beating in on the white old boards. Some chickens were scratching in the grass at the foot of the steps, and one had boldly mounted and was stepping heavily, solemnly and aimlessly across the gallery. There was a prison odor of pinks in the air, and the sounds of Negro's laughter was coming across the flowering cotton field. Master Ori stood contemplating the children. She looked with a critical eye upon Mark Wright, who had been left staggering beneath the weight of the chubby Lodi. She surveyed with the same calculating air, Marcus mingling her silent tears with the audible griefs and liberation of Tinom. During those few contemplative moments, she was collecting herself, determining upon a line of action which should be identical with a line of duty. She began by feeding them. If Mamsel Ori's responsibility might have begun and ended there, they could easily have been dismissed, for her letter was 
imply provided against an emergency of this nature. But little children are not little pigs. They require and demand attention, which were wholly unexpected by Mamsley Rowley, and which she was ill prepared to give. She was indeed very inept in her management of all this children during the first few days. How could she know that Margaret always wept when spoken to in a loud and commanding tone of voice? It was a peculiarity of Margaret's. She became acquainted with T. Norm's patients from fathers only when she had plucked all the choicest guardians and pings for the apparent purpose of critically studying their botanical construction. T ain't enough to tell and must be allowed. Macri instructed her, You got to tie up in a chair. It's what my mom or Tom do when she's bad. She tie up in a chair. The chair in which Masley always tied Tinom was roomy and comfortable, and he seized the opportunity to take a nap in it in the afternoon being warmed. At night, when she ordered them one and all to bed as she would have showed the chickens into the hen house, they stayed uncomprehending before her. What about the little white night girls? that had to be taken from pillow slip in which they were brought over and shaken by some strong hand till she snapped like ox whips. What about the tub of water which had to be brought and set in the middle of the floor in which a little, tired, dusty sun brown feet had everyone to be watched sweet and clean? And it made Macri and Macret laugh merrily. The idea that Master Ulrich should for a moment have believed that Tinom could fall asleep in being told the story of crop meetings or Lokaro Ovos, or that Lordy could fall asleep at all without being rocked and sung to. I tell you, Aunt Ruby, Master already informed her cook in confident. Me, I rather manage a dozen plantation than for children. It's children since bonds. Don't talk to me about children. Tian expected such as you would know everything about him. Master Ori, I see that plenty yesterday. When I spy that like child praying with you basket of keys, you don't know that makes children grow up hard headed to pray with keys. That's like it makes them teeth hard to look in a looking glass. Them's the thing you got to know in the resin and management of children. Master Ori certainly did not pretend or aspire to such subtle and far-reaching knowledge on the subject as Aunt Ruby possessed, who had raised five and bore six in her day. She was glad enough to learn a few little mother tricks to serve the moment's need. Tinom's sticky fingers compel her to unearth white aprons that she had not worn for years, and she had to accustom herself to his moist kisses. The expressions of an affectionate and exuberant nature. She got down her sewing basket, which she seldom used, from the top shelf of the armoire and pressed it within the ready and easy reach with stone slips and bottleless waist demanded. It took her some days to become accustomed to the laughing, the crying, the chattering that echoed through the house and around it all day long. And it was not the first or second night that she could sleep comfortably with little Lodi's hot 
plump body pressed close against her, and the little one's warm breath beating her cheek like the fanning of a bird's wing. But at the end of two weeks, Marcel Ori had grown quite used to these things, and she no longer complained. It was also at the end of two weeks that Marcel Ori, one evening looking away toward the crib where the cattle were being fed, saw well since blue car turning the bend of the road. Others sat beside the molotov, upright and alert, as they drew near. The young woman's beaming face indicated that her homecoming was a happy one, but its coming, unannounced and unexpected, drew Mamsa Ari into factor that was almost agitation. The children had to be gathered. Where was Tinom? Yonder in the shed, putting an edge of his knife at the green stone, and Macry and Macet. Cutting and fashioning doll rags in the corners of the gallery, as for Lodi, she was safe enough in Mamsel Ori's arm, and she had screamed with delight at sight of the familiar blue cart, which was bringing her mother back to her. The excitement was all over, and they were gone. How serious was when they were gone? Mamsel Ori stood upon the gallery, looking and listening. She could no longer see the cart. The red sunset and the blue gray twilight had together flung a purple mist across the field and road that hid it from her view. She could no longer hear the whistling and creaking of its wheels, but she could still faintly hear the shrill, glad voices of the children. She turned into the house. There was much work awaiting her. For the children had left and sad disorder behind them, but she did not at once set about that task of writing it. Mademoiselle Aurie seated herself beside the table. She gave one slow glance through the room, into which the evening shadows were creeping and depending around her solitary figure. She let her head fall down upon the bended arm, and began to cry. Oh, but she cried not softly as women often do. She cried like a man with sobs that seemed to tear her very soul. She did not notice it. Ponto licking her hand. The end. And I found out that it's hard to read the speech of character because I can't imagine. What that pronounced on the speech and many vocabulary, which I have not known them. <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening. Bye.